Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of the show today, Across Campus. Today in the studio, we're going to be talking about Occupy. And so I have a student in... I have one Puget Sound student in the studio with me today, Polly. And I also have Jamie, a Tacoma resident, with me today. And so that's the general topic, whether it's Occupy Tacoma, Occupy Puget Sound, Occupy Wall Street. We'll kind of let the conversation go wherever it ends up going. So in this first segment, I would just kind of like to do a brief interview with my guests so our listeners have a better idea of who they're listening to. But Polly, uh, what can you tell us about yourself? I'm Polly. I'm a senior from, originally from Washington, D.C., but I've spent, obviously, the last four years out here in Tacoma, which has been a really great experience. And I'm majoring in politics and government with a comparative politics emphasis and minoring in environmental studies. Um, I guess the formal name is environmental policy and decision making. And I don't really know what I'm going to do after I graduate, but I'm looking forward to staying involved with the Occupy movement and hopefully doing something along the lines of political activism, whether it's for a nonprofit or uh, actually working in politics. And what led you to your major? Um, I guess coming from D.C., politics has always really been part of my upbringing, um, just living that close to everything. And uh, my dad is a journalist, so that's been, um, it's been kind of on the forefront, just news, reading the newspaper a lot. And when I came to UPS, I realized that it's a really good program with a lot of strong professors, so. Um, yeah, the PNG department here is strong. Yeah, definitely. Sure. So right off the bat, I was just really excited about getting more interested in politics and learning as much as I could. And what, what kind of a beat does your dad write? Did that introduce you to any specific topic or area? Um, he's just, uh, in general, a news editor, so he's kind of worked with a lot of different papers across the country, and now he's working on um, a local journal in D.C. So, um, yeah, pretty much just news rather than opinion or anything else. But um, it's interesting, just like he would stay late at work anytime there was a big current event going on, 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina or whatever, so... It's, I mean, that in a way has directly impacted how, what I've been interested in and kind of being focused on current events. Well, you said that growing up, I mean, I'm sure growing up in D.C. kind of instills a sense of like maybe empower, empowerment or just involvement in politics. Like that's just kind of something that's more, uh, I mean, that's just a conducive environment to that. But what made you move to the West Coast to <laughs> study politics rather than staying on the East Coast or in D.C.? Yeah, um, I was just looking at schools out here. My cousin went to Lewis and Clark, so I was kind of looking at okay. the West Coast as another option. Um, originally, I thought I would go to school on the East Coast, and kind of last minute, I was deciding between here and University of Rochester and just visiting out here. Um, I really enjoyed it a lot, and I mean, everyone says it, but it's definitely more relaxed on the West Coast and not as fast-paced, not as stressful. And I feel like the East Coast, in a lot of ways, especially in the academic world, is competitive. And maybe that feeds off of because of all the politics there. But um, my high school is really competitive, so it's nice kind of getting a an atmosphere where people are more collaborative rather than trying to Competitive, compete. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I looked at East Coast schools as well. But I kinda, I, as I kind of went around, like, Boston, uh, didn't get, I, I applied to some schools in D.C., but never never ended up visiting those. But I could just kind of tell that there was an, there was an East Coast edge. Oh, totally. And so <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think that's kind of what you're get, getting to. Yeah. But, yeah. And, Jamie, you're our first Tacoma resident that we've had in the studio, so l lucky you. Well, the first. I feel honored. <laughs> yeah. So where, where are you from, uh, and what do you do, how would you get here to Tacoma? to Tacoma? So I'm originally from Ohio. Actually, speaking of competition versus cooperation, I'm from a now historic village that was built on a cooperative economy. It wasn't capitalist and it wasn't socialist. It was a mixture of the two, whereas you can have an economy that is built upon an exchange of money for value where everyone wins instead of one person winning and, and another person being pushed down and being taken advantage of. So that's a place called Zor, Ohio. And my, um, my ex-husband went to graduate school here at UPS and we have a wonderful child together and I would never 
ever move my son away from his fantastic and brilliant father that was smart enough to move us out here to Tacoma, Washington. And thus, I stayed here and established a company called CU Strategic Planning, where I uh, help not-for-profit cooperative credit unions to invent poverty reduction programs that help to deploy affordable capital which Muhammad Yunus has found, and he's, of course, the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winning um, author and founder of the Grameen uh, Foundation and the Grameen Bank. So he found that uh, deploying affordable capital is the number one means, the most effective means of reducing poverty. So what we do is develop that type of program in communities ranging from assisting native Hawaiians in Hawaii to immigrants in New York City, to Hispanic families on the border that are very much so discriminated against even if they are American citizens. And when you think about the fact that we have 3.5 million or 1% of U.S. citizens living in poverty as homeless individuals, we're really approaching a point in our country that is comparable to a third world developing nation where the profit maximizing version of capitalism that some people view as positive is actually not working. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's simply what works and doesn't work. And it's not working for our, many of the people that are vulnerable, whether it's speaking English as a second language. Yeah, this uh, a little over a week ago, I went to a public forum at UW Tacoma, and Occupy Tacoma was just doing a forum for anybody within Tacoma that wanted, that wanted to check out the movement, wanted to tune in and so I went to that, and one, one of the topics that uh, that was brought up by one of the panel members was like, you need to get out, and get out there, and get yourself educated. And he he encouraged us to to be well versed in this because I think one of the criticisms of Occupy is that people really don't know what they're getting themselves into. They don't really know what the arguments are, and so it's it, it tends to look much more emotional than it does logical. And so he encouraged us to get out and educate ourselves on it. And so my my economics professor, Pierre Lee, sent us a bunch of articles that really broke down mm -hmm. tax structure in the United States and compared us to other countries. And uh, the specific articles that I ended up looking at compared uh, income back in 1980 to income, I think, in 2006 and 2008. And there's always that lag in there because statistics are slow to come out. Mm -hmm. But it showed that there was a huge gap increase between 1980 and 2006. Like, that was undeniable. And then when you compare that to countries in Europe and then Japan, like, those, that's, that's usually the group that the United States kind of gets lumped into. Uh -huh. Like, the United States is lagging way behind as far as how we're, how we're producing equality. Right, and including, so, so something that would be of importance to UPS students, including access to opportunity. So um, the American dream and what it has been historically is access to opportunity to be anything that you want to be. And it, it used to be that the United States, States ranked first as having the opportunity to move from low income or middle income to high wealth by using your skills to do something that you love to do. So creating your own small business, for example, now the United States, States ranks far, far below and behind many European nations, including Denmark. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. I'm I'm studying African American studies, and it's interesting to look at social mobility and where people can start and where they can get to. And there's always this American narrative that everybody has this exact same chance that everybody else has, and like we tr we try to create this illusion that there's not there's a, that there's not a system that will benefit some and be detrimental to others. And so we, we work a lot to kind of create that narrative. But I think when, when you kind of like look past that, when you look at what's actually happening, mm -hmm. you don't see uh, perfect opportunity arise for everybody within the country. That's right. And, and one of the things, too, when you look at your professor telling you to get educated about the subject and the tax researching what's going on with our taxes is ex an excellent place to start. It's also being a savvy consumer, being educated about what you're listening to in the media. Just because someone says it doesn't mean it's true. So I'll give you an example. Newt Gingrich, just this morning I, I saw on CNN that he was saying, I've never heard any member of, of the Occupy movement 
be ask an intelligent question or provide an intelligent answer to, about the economy. And that's not the reality. I'm here talking about the economy. I'm one of the I'm, I'm in the in the country the number one writer of federal grants for not for profit credit unions. I am absolutely a supporter of Occupy Wall Street. I can tell you historically about the Great Recession and Depression being their similarities and how the cooperative economy played in that. And it's actually our greed in America is what's undercutting the economy and even helping people to lose their jobs, being part of that, and not creating jobs as far as what's the impact then on foreclosures. You look at all of these things with unlimited campaign giving from the corporate greed, not serving the people, but actually feeding into the politicians' drive just to keep their jobs and undercutting democracy and the economy. So we have, must be uh, savvy consumers of the media in order to make sure that we're not just having a subjective opinion about what someone else is telling us. You mu don't take, for example, some people say this, many people do this. That's all opinion. None of that is fact. And I'm sure that when Polly's talking about her father being a journalist and writing about the facts, he would never say some people think this or everyone's asked that. That's all opinion based. It's not based in fact. Yeah, and I mean, we've definitely seen a lot of brilliant minds speak about Occupy Wall Street. Joseph Stiglitz has written articles. Um, Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times has written plenty of articles supporting Occupy Wall Street. And I think that, yeah, it's definitely almost a selective hearing type of thing when you have politicians or everyday people on the street saying, no one's, no one's giving clear goals, no one's giving solutions, and that's not true. And I mean, also, that being said, I was reading in the New York Times a few weeks ago, they had an editorial um, by the editorial board saying that it's not really the job of the protesters to be providing goals, that's the job of the people who we put into office, and that's mm -hmm. true. I mean, if, I mean, obviously, maybe we can't really trust them anymore, but I think that we're not the ones who are supposed to be coming up with these solutions to fix our economy because, I mean, it's empowering, yeah, we're everyday people and we don't have all the answers, but also if we do actually live in a democracy, then the people we elected should be solving problems and they should be the ones coming up with these solutions. Well, that's, that's what I've seen with the Occupy movement. It's about setting the agenda. It's about bringing out the issues and, like, you need to have profession professionals who... Know how to know how to write bills. Know know what what kind of approaches you can take to those issues. Mm -hmm. But I think the big advantage of Occupy right now is that it's it's setting the agenda. I was struck yesterday by how similar the Occupy movement is to what Gandhi did and non-resistance. He there's you know many fam fam famous quotes about his strategy being that he by having non-resistance that's also non-violent was actually in control. And if you look at the what the similarities were as well, the people in India couldn't even make salt. It was under British rule that only the British people could make salt. And so what he did was it was he and a group of thousands went to the ocean and made salt because it's important to live off of. And so he did these things that were all about... Uh, not conforming to what the law was. And that's exactly exactly what the Occupy movement is. Just by occupying, they're intentionally breaking the law in a way that's nonviolent, shaping what's going on in the media and saying, in fact, we did elect you and we're not happy, and that does make us in control as long as we continue to act in unity and noncompliance with what we view as evil. And that's another Ghani quote. It's our duty to not comply with what we view as evil. And I assert that allowing 3.5 million million people or 1% of our total population to live in homelessness and to talk about cutting our budget while not increasing the tax rates on the rich and allowing corporations to give unlimited amounts to the politicians that essentially buys their votes is evil. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and you're listening to Across Campus. Good morning, everybody. You're listening, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of Across Campus. Uh, today in the studio, we're talking about Occupy, and kind of like I said before, uh, this conversation could be about Occupy Tacoma, Occupy Wall Street, uh, but we're leaving it kind of open, just the idea of Occupy, that's the subject for today. Uh, I went to the first rally here in Tacoma, 
And one of the things that one of the things that kind of surprised me, and I wasn't really expecting, was the focus on labor unions. Like we stopped, we stopped by a grocery a grocery store downtown, and we also stopped by the Marriott Hotel. And the guy who was kind of like leading the leading the rally brought up that these were non union employers. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to relate to that because I didn't really have a particular feeling about labor unions or who who the, who particular hotels or grocery stores are employing. But uh, Jamie, you know you know a lot more about labor unions than me. And and my background is diverse on this. I was raised. My grandfather owned a car dealership, and he was really against labor unions and my mother she managed an, uh, the unemployment office and now she she just retired from working at the in Ohio, at the high levels in the state of Ohio where there's a very famous background for what went on with the unions and then we look at my interest in credit unions and Edward Filene who is the founder of the the credit union movement in the United States also fat was a founding member of the United States Chamber of Commerce and International Chamber of Commerce and the labor movement. So the premise here after the Great Depression is part of what created that was we overproduced and underpaid employees so that the economy came to a halt because we had too many goods and there weren't wasn't anyone that could buy them that that doesn't work so we look at what not what's right and what's wrong but what works and what doesn't work that doesn't work so he believed that when we compensate our employees fairly which is why he supported his own employees the filing department store in collective bargaining and helping the state that that was in to create collective bargaining and unions that it actually works for not just businesses and his business but the economy as a whole can you imagine a world today where the United States Chamber of Commerce and labor unions work together. What would that do for our economy? Yeah. So that that's part of where I'm coming from. And at the same time, as a small business owner, I have about 10 employees from Boston to Hawaii to right here in Tacoma. What would it do for me if I was undercompensating my employees and they unionized? Well, that wouldn't work. But at the same time, I compensate my employees very fairly. Polly and I were just talking about internships and even compensating in Interns. And so, do I have fear about that? No, I don't have fear about that. Yeah, I, my, my family has a construction company back in Minnesota, and I worked there for a, for a couple of summers. And we hire, we only hire union, but I kind of saw both sides to that. Like there were some times where like the union was saying one thing or pushing for something, or there was a strike. It went on for a long time. There were minimal gains. And so th there were situations like that where it's like, so you're putting everybody out of work for uh, for like X number of weeks for this number for like for this small gain. It could take, I think we calculate it out to be like 20 years to gain back like what you've lost in this well, in this time period. And so like we, there there have been like a lot of like conversations like within our own family like uh, like are the unions a good thing for the construct like for the roofing and construction industry? Most of the time we kind of ended up saying yes. But there was also that side of, the, uh, of it that we like weren't quite sure about. Well, I think the power of the union is that you have a collective voice versus a few people striking individually or picketing individually. And that, I think, definitely parallels into the Occupy mo movement, where you have people across the country in every major city striking or protesting for relatively the same goals or at least against the same um, injustices that have happened and voicing the same grievances across the country. So I think with the union, you have a collection of people who have like-minded goals and that gives them a voice versus if you have a non-unionized company, then you just have a handful of dissenters who maybe don't have the same venue to express their grievances or ask for um, specific demands. Polly, that's insightful, and if you look at the power of that, when you have conversations, I don't know if either of you have had, as you've been discussing this with your family, Casey, the discussion of our unions relevant today. My brother and I talk about this a lot, and he says, oh, unions aren't relevant today. And, and there is something to be said. You can see how the power structure of the unlimited campaign donations can lead to greed and corruption, whether it's in unions or with corporations, because our government should have boundaries. And that's one of the big issues in Occupy of let's not let unlimited campaign donations buy votes. But when there isn't unions in, in an industry, you can see significant loss of power that is terribly hurtful to vulnerable 
vulnerable groups. So one industry that is ununionized is the agricultural industry. And Polly, as an environmental, uh, a, a poli sci major with environmental interest, you can see what are what is an industry that has some of the most env har harshest environmental policies and how they impact not only the earth but also the workers. And the average lifespan of an agricultural worker is less than half of a worker in traditional fields across the United States. They live only into their 40s across the board, the average lifespan in an industry with no unions. So then you look at how profound that is, and it's impossible to say that unions are not relevant. Unions were founded to protect child labor, working long working hours, harsh working conditions, and we see that those harsh working conditions in an area where there are no unions are ever present today and absolutely impacting the lifespan of, of, of American citizens. All right, and I'm going to change gears a little bit. I want to bring this back to campus. So, like, I, I do want to try and bring out parts of Occupy that are relevant to the University of Puget Sound. Pa Paula, you've been involved with Occupy Puget well, I guess I, I'm not quite sure if it's Occupy Puget Sound yeah, or I mean, that, but we're not occupying space, but you could call it Occupy Puget Sound, definitely. And so how did you first get together that group of students here on campus? Um, that's actually an interesting question. Um, I became passionate about the Occupy movement pretty much as soon as I learned about it. I think the numbers speak for themselves as we've already talked about this hour and just um, you know, you see these facts. They're not opinions. It's, you know, the fact that 1% of the population owns 40% of the nation's wealth, the fact that another 1% of the population is homeless, as we were talking about earlier. And so just reading all of the articles that were just kind of emerging within the first two weeks of Occupy, I mean, I was reading another article saying that the phrase income inequality has quintupled in its use in since the Occupy movement. And, and people are talking about these things now. And so... That got me really passionate about it, and then I went to uh, one of the first, I think it was the second Tacoma General Assembly downtown at the um, at one of the churches, and I saw, I went with a few UPS students, we kind of just commented on the Facebook page, like, hey, is anyone going from campus? Let's carpool. So I met a few people that way, and then when we got there, we saw maybe a dozen or so UPS students, and we all kind of got together afterwards and said, how can we bridge this gap between campus and Tacoma, which exists in so many other facets as well. I think that a lot of people talk about the campus bubble, that people aren't really reaching out into the community as much as maybe we should be, which I agree with. Um, so a few of us got together at my house after that and talked about, you know, how can we bring this momentum to campus? Because the cool thing about Occupy is that it's already happening across the country. You don't have to start something new. You just have to kind of jump on the bandwagon and go with it because it's, I mean, it's picking up momentum. It's just three months old now. So, I mean, there, it's definitely going places as we can all see. And um, so, we were trying to figure out how to bring that here to campus, and a few of us were discussing different strategies and how to get people kind of hooked on this idea because, um, you know, if you're a student, you have so much going on in your daily life. You have class and schoolwork, and a lot of people are working jobs as well, and it's hard to kind of say, here, here's an issue that's relevant to you, and here's why you should care. Um, so we hosted a kind of a not a protest, but an informational session in the piano lounge um, right at the end of September, right around fall break, I guess, um, early October, talking about uh, what Occupy is. And we were actually really lucky to be joined by Jesse Meyerson, who is an independent journalist and part of the media outreach team on Occupy Wall Street. And he writes for Truth Out and a lot of other progressive or um, kind of radical blogs. And he... Uh, was visiting his girlfriend who has been really involved in Occupy at UPS. And so he happened to be on campus and gave a really, um, I think, a really inspiring speech on campus, which is amazing to see how many people got excited about Occupy after that. Um, but we still have a long way to go. I think that our campus generally is somewhat apathetic, which is unfortunate, I think, especially being a politics major, seeing that as frustrating, um, but I think people have a reason to be frustrated and in a time when it seems like one individual voice is so powerless, 
you know, I think the Occupy movement is really inspiring for people to see that there are people across the country in every corner of the world that are frustrated. And so kind of getting that momentum on campus has been a big thing in these past few weeks. All right, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. All right, we're back on Across Campus. My name is Casey Krolchek. I'm the host of the show, and we're talking about Occupy. And so we kind of left off. Polly was telling us about Occupy at Puget Sound, like how students are getting involved, and then the dynamics of that on campus. And I think it's, it's been really interesting for me because I... I, I was kind of like you. Like as soon as as soon as as soon as I started hearing about stuff going on in New York, it caught my it caught my attention right away. Because over the, over the summer, I had been in Kashmir and I was at the University of Kashmir for for a little over a week, and I spent a lot of time talking to scholars there about democracy and the idea of democracy. And at, at first, like they 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 were they were ready to like have their guns blaring and ready to go because like they knew all about American democracy and how it doesn't work and. We th- they thought we would be on different pages, and then, but it was kind of like, no, guys, like I actually agree with you. Like it's not re- it's not really working in a lot of the ways that I would like it to. And whether that's whether that's in uh, turnouts for for elections, in uh, or or just like mo- movements like this that are that are pushing for a system that not just like that do- isn't just looking for what works, but like what how the system is- like how the system should work, but what actually would operate best. And so like we ended up having like a lot of great conversations and we discovered that we were more on the same page than we than we, than we initially thought we would be. But as soon as like this movement came up, I was like this is what I was talking about. People agree with me. This is like democracy like isn't working as well as it should. And so like I I've been exchanging uh emails and different conversations on Facebook with with guys back in Kashmir who want to know more about the Occupy Wall Street movement and like why why and why to get why people are getting involved in that and they like some, this one guy Hilal was saying like oh you never really had democracy in the states and i don't think it was quite that but it's kind of like i see that it can be so much better than what it currently is and so i think that's kind of what got me involved in the movement and especially being in a US politics class right now uh that really got me motivated to get out there and join the protests. When I met the two of you, I bought coffee for the Occupy UPS students that were on the corner of Union by the Metronome Coffee Shop. And during the break, we were talking about how people brought you banana bread and pizza that day. And it really, when Polly was talking about how it, it, there's an apathy and Occupy gives an avenue for action that's inspiring and brings hope. I think that's something that the students at UPS share with the community leaders in Tacoma that are pushing the movement forward in Tacoma as a secondary city to have its own Occupy camp. And this camp is full of people and full of tents and has marches of hundreds of people. The the one march that I was at had almost a thousand people, seven hundred people, and it was, you know, equal to the size of a march in Seattle. It was really remarkable. Remarkable, and I've I've seen amongst my friends that have uh, a socially responsible attitude, you know, glistening eyes, really tears, and emotion of. For so long, we've had to bottle up, having no channel for speaking out of being lovers of democracy, loving living in a free society where women can vote, which isn't true in even some democracies, like Muslim democracies, like Mali and West Africa, that uh, women still have to give all of their money to their husbands and brothers and, and fathers. But here in our country, it's working to an extent, but there are things that don't work. And Occupy is an avenue for feeling great. Great hope that together we can address those things and still retain the system that is um, is inspiring of itself. You know, the American ideals are inspiring. Our forefathers forefather- did something great, and Occupy isn't different than that. It's what makes the democracy of itself work. And we look at the women's rights movement and the civil rights movement. They weren't popular at the time. People were being arrested. They, they tried to force feed the women that were protesting for their right to vote. And the fact that we're, we are standing up against this country and the majority that want the system of corporate greed to stay in place, it's, it's actually a reason to have a leaderless movement. 
we look at what happens even when a woman speaks up. Five women speak up against Herman Cain for sexual harassment, and what do they do? They attack their character. So by having a leaderless movement, it's in there trying to say, oh, this is an example of why this movement isn't very organized and one person isn't speaking about, about the economy. There are many intelligence people that are speaking. So just because they're saying it isn't true, and it's an exact reason why we'd want to have a leaderless movement, because there's not one person to attack. Instead, the power is with the students at UPS, the community leaders in Tacoma, in cities and in campuses across the nation, just continuing to act together. And that's why this movement won't go anywhere. There isn't one person to bring down. It's all of us working together. Well, and Jamie, I think you're absolutely right about as far as like Occupy being a movement that's allowing for people just to kind of let loose or, or con and connect to. Like, I think, I think that's why I became an IP, an international political economy major, is because I saw like all these systematic problems and I saw that there was like huge need for policy adjustments like within, within U.S. democracy, within foreign relations, and in, in global politics. And so... When I ha when like an opportunity like this comes up, where you have an outlet, you have a forum, and you have a big group of people, like, it, it, I mean, and the power in this movement is that it doesn't have a leader. It doesn't have. It, it's it's very inclusive right now. And so, I mean, it's it's an exciting thing to be a part of. And that it's okay for people to have dissenting opinions. So if you and I felt differently about the issue of unions, or even if one of us wasn't sure, there are parts of the union movement that I'm just unsure about. It's okay. What unites us is the premise that corporate greed should not be ruling, ru you know, ruling our country, which is in fact happening. The fact that unlimited campaign contributions can can be given actually puts the politicians themselves, no matter how good they are, in a position where they will lose their job if they don't vote a certain way. And you can see this across the boards on, on issues. So part of my apathy for years was that the profit-maximizing banks that were giving mortgages to people that couldn't afford them, that were sending out 0% interest credit cards and raising the rates, in some cases, to above 40%. Really taking advantage of people had, were giving these unlimited campaign contributions to elected officials, even the best, even the kindest Democratic elected official in our own community was voting against credit unions, not-for-profit credit unions, increasing the amount that they can give in small business loans to people when people need jobs. Now, why would they vote that way? Why would they not sponsor that legislation? Well, other community leaders would say in closed-door meetings that that politician said is he couldn't lose the bank's contributions to his campaign. When we have issues like that going on, it's clear that there's not bags of cash going across tables, but that votes are being purchased, and you can see it on issues. And if we remove that from the table, how could what's going on in our democracy move from not working to working? It's, it is really inspiring, and it removes that apathy. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think if you look at the front runners for the most recent elections, presidential elections, um, you have competing politicians who have the almost exact same investors in their campaign. You know, Goldman Sachs putting in tons of money into the Obama campaign, almost just as money into the McCain campaign. Exactly. So either way, whoever wins, they have their foot in the door and they, you know, they get their back scratched. Whoever sure. It's buying a vote voted. no matter who they're buying it yeah. from. Exactly. We're going to fund the other guy equally to you, but if you don't have our money, you're really at a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I guess, uh, Polly, I kind of want to know more about the conversation that's going on within the comparative politics department. Like, what are the different voices that are coming out, and what are you hearing from that department on campus? Um, it's hard. I mean, for good reason, I think that a lot of professors don't express their personal political opinions in class. Um, I have met with a few professors during office hours or outside of class just to kind of shoot the breeze about Occupy Wall Street. But um, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say that the department takes any specific stance on Occupy. But um, I mean, a lot of professors that I've spoken with, um, and actually our president, uh, President Thomas, said, you know, this has been a long time coming, and I think that people have been expecting or kind of waiting for something like Occupy to pick up because, I mean, you look at the 2008 collapse, everyone suffers except for that top 1% of our country. So, um, you know, people have been pretty upset with the system. And I think going back to your question, um, the dialogue on campus has been 
increasing, I think, in recent weeks, just with, um, in my intro to comparative politics class, we actually have discussed, you know, kind of comparing Occupy Wall Street to different movements across the country throughout and across the world throughout history, um, just kind of looking at, you know, here's what happened in Tiananmen Square, for example, or here's what happened in, uh, you know, in Soviet Russia, just kind of all these different uh, movements happening with, you know, not necessarily the same goals, but similar instances of an oppressed people rising up against the whatever the political regime was at the time. And actually, I, I wanted to jump back to, uh, you mentioned that professors, like, aren't, re like, I mean, you do have to kind of stick to academics for the most part, like, when, you, when you're in your classes, and it's, it's, it's more about, like, bringing out topics and, like, show, and, show, and showing all sides and aspects, because I think that's the advantage of a Puget Sound education. Like, you're supposed to bring out multiple perspectives in anything that you're doing. But uh, it has been interesting because I, I've seen a lot of Puget Sound professors down at Occupy, at, at Occupy rallies or just going to the forums. Like, and if, to go to, when you go to an Occupy forum or, to, or even to, the gen, to, like, one of the general meetings, like, it's not about... You like it's not just for people who are for the movement. I think I think if anything, like Occupy has been very like inviting and welcoming of of people of like dissenters who say like you get you guys have that you guys have this wrong because we want to hear exactly what they have to say and like we want to we want to be able to hear those sorts of things. So whenever whenever I've heard of somebody who's who either discredits the movement or disagrees with it completely. I'm I'm encouraged to ask like so tell me about so tell me about like what you think like what's your perspective I want I would I would love to know it and I think that's kind of something like a common theme that I've seen from all from all from almost all occupiers people want to hear about the different perspectives that are out there yeah definitely I think um, it's funny that you mentioned that because at the first general assembly that I went to um, one of my professors was there and or a former professor and he approached me and he said look around you, do you see any of your liberal-leaning professors? And I said, no, I don't know where they are. And he said, well, you should get on their case, which I think was a good point, just kind of... I mean, it's not a political movement in the sense that, you know, it hasn't been co-opted and it won't be co-opted by either political party, but um, it's true that I, I think a lot of professors and students at this school would at least sympathize or, if not, fully agree with the Occupy movement, and I think that... Um, it's. I think we will see in the spring, um, just with Occupy movements everywhere gaining momentum, I think we will see a larger um, political involvement from professors and students and hopefully other people in Tacoma as well. Um, but like you said, I mean, it can definitely be incorporated into classes uh, without being indoctrinating, I think. And um, actually, one of the classes I'm taking is uh, kind of focuses on Marx and a lot of the great political thinkers. And I remember when we were on the corner of Sixth and Union, um, someone came up to us and started talking about, you know, his different issues with Occupy Wall Street and, you know, what he was upset about and why it didn't represent him. And um, and I was kind of, you know, half listening in, but also kind of protesting off to the side and uh, letting other people kind of deal with that conversation because, of course, you have people who want to disagree or pick a fight or whatever. And I heard him mention communism and Marxism, and I was like, wait a second, I just read a month's worth of Marx. So uh, that was really cool, just bringing in, you know, the liberal arts education and being able to say, oh, well, actually, you know, in his essay on a strange labor, he talks about the alienation of the worker and the capitalist. And, you know, he was really surprised, which was cool, just seeing that, people kind of come in with these conceptions of these phrases like communism, Marxism, socialism, uh, capitalism even, and there's, they're kind of tossed around unfairly, I think, and there's such a discrepancy with, with these definitions that I don't think should exist because if you look at the defining literature on any of those words or any of those ideologies, then I think you can find a better kind of encapsulating definition of them than what the media is telling you. I agree completely, Polly. I mean, you see often democracy and capitalism being interchanged. They are not the same thing. Not at all. You can say one or the other can work better, and it doesn't mean that you're against democracy, and it doesn't mean that you're against capitalism. Yeah. Well, I, have to, I have to do a quick station identification. 
Uh, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound, and this show is across campus, and my name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host. I want to keep going with the conversation, so we're not going to cut to music right now, but yeah, just keep, go- just keep going with where, where you're going with that. Oh, great. So you did your station. Oh, yeah, okay. that's, all, that's, all, that's all we need to do. Normally we, play a so- normally we play a song or something to take a break. But maybe maybe kind of that's how it. we can have such a free conversation. You're not beholden to anyone yeah. giving you money. <laughs> that's a wonderful thing about public radio. <laughs> well, I, I was just agreeing with, with Polly about um, the interchange of terminology that do not mean the same thing. That suddenly, if you're speaking out for a capitalism that isn't profit maximizing, you know, Muhammad Yunus believes in capitalism. It, Grameen is a bank. It's just not a profit maximizing bank. And you can see other companies in the United States that are incredibly profitable, like Patagonia. Yvonne Chouinard intentionally has not taken his company public because instead of profit maximizing, he um, it believes in a model where his business sets the standard, and as a result, we see organic uh, organic cotton and other um, uh, environmentally friendly products being taken into stores like Walmart. And he and his Patagonia changing the way that even Nike does business. So there is a there is a consensus in the United States right now among the upper upper class and, and elite and, and higher wealth individuals that to support capitalism you must support profit maximizing. But when we look at a profit maximizing practice that really did not work and undercut the entire economy, all you need to look at is what happened with mortgage lending and the foreclosure crisis. Profit maximizing is when you're doing business in a way that's cannibalizing your own consumers. What happens? That entire segment of the economy is undercut. And what does that do? It spreads to other areas of the economy. And so actually, as a great lover of capitalism, I don't support profit maximizing. And I am on a path to um, educate uh, family members, friends, uh, community leaders, that there is a difference between profit maximizing and social enterprise practices and that they both exist in capitalism. Yeah, this was a topic that was brought up at the forum. Uh, somebody somebody brought up... Oh, shoot. What was the... Well, I'm going to have to come back to that. I just lost my thought. But any other thoughts on... Oh, yeah, sorry. It just, it just came back to me. Uh, he brought up that capitalism... Gosh, I keep on having it leave me. I, I have it like in the front and like in the back of my mind. I'll get back to it. But um, I wanted to bring up police brutality because that was something that Polly we had talked about that we wanted to bring up. Uh, it's something that we did that we did talk about at uh, the forum because I mean I, I asked the I asked the panel like what's the relationship with the, with the Tacoma police been like, and what do you think is the tipping point between violence and peaceful protests? And Occupy Tacoma, Occupy Tacoma was actually like very pos- very positive and had a very good relationship with the police, and they they attributed that to the cooperation that they, that that they've an understanding that they've had between each other. Like if the police have asked Tacoma occupiers to move or to disperse, like they've just kind of done, they've just kind of done it. Like they're not going to be standoffish with the police, and that's something that the that the uh, that the movement here has declared. Um, but it hasn't been that way in a lot of other spots in the country. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes back to what Jamie was talking about earlier with um, this kind of idea of civil disobedience or just, um, you know, knowingly breaking laws because maybe you believe that they're unjust or that they are an obstacle to creating a more just society. And I think um, not in Tacoma, but if you look at other cities like you were mentioning, um, like, for example, what comes to mind most recently is not in a city, but on college campuses um, at the UC schools, we saw a lot of recent police brutality. If you look at any of the videos on YouTube or any of the citizen, this kind of citizen reporting, um, you see that it is a nonviolent movement. People sitting, you know, linking arms in a sit-in or linking arms, occupying a space. And the violence is always instigated by the police officers. And it's always, um, you know, you see this face-off and tensions rising. And the first move is from the police attacking the protesters. And I think that these videos are really powerful, not only in that they show this horrific violence, but they show that here is unwarranted police brutality that should not be tolerated in our country. And... um, 
just looking to uh, we, Casey and I are watching the pepper spray video uh, before we started this show and it's just so upsetting seeing these students linking arms sitting on the ground um, and then a police officer kind of almost it's interesting that it's a rogue police officer um, I'm not obviously I don't know the actual account of what happened other than the videos but he is you know mingling with these other officers and takes it upon himself to I guess um, I don't really know what his intention was actually but kind of it was actually the way that they were trained yeah. So um, I've read up on this subject heavily. Okay. I'm, I'm very interested in it. And it was the way that they were trained. The fact that they linked arms and didn't let go is resistance. Uh, they were trained that the pepper spray is used not only as a, a tool to you know combat uh, active aggression, so if it was a march and they were taking up the street, but also to quote, uh, get groups of people or individuals to sub quote submit and they weren't submitting, wow. so they weren't letting go of the arms. And and really, that's appalling. It was appalling that these innocent students where their parents had paid for them to go to school on a campus, if that would happen here at UPS, what would be the result? And we see the result. The teachers themselves called for the chancellor of the school to be removed unless there's an investigation. Now there's an investigation that's comprised of community members and students, as well as the police department itself, independently of them. So, Yeah, and like you said, I mean, pepper spray is used to subdue people, which, um, you know, why would you use that after you tell people to disperse and then you incapacitate them? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. And I think that, you know, the the city of Davis police department has kind of said, oh, well, you know, we are trapped or, you know, whatever excuses mm -hmm. they've been trying to come up with. But I think that, um, you know, it's very obvious in these videos that it's, it's a police officer kind of taking things into his own hands, not necessarily given orders to do this. And that is, I think, maybe an act of saying, okay, well, I need to take a stand against these protesters, or I was called in, this is my duty. And I'm wondering, you know, we haven't really seen a huge, and I know that, I mean, I can't say this because I, my job isn't to be a police officer, but, mm -hmm. you know, from what I understand, if you're a police officer, you have the... I don't know if I'd say right, but you have the option of saying this is something that is wrong and this is something that um, does not fall into the code of what it means to be a police officer. Um, I'm not sure, you know, the rules that they follow, but I feel as though, you know, when are we ever going to see in this movement a time where police are saying, you know, and, and it has happened, some officers saying, I'm not going to show up to work the day that we evict the protesters from our city because I disagree with that. Um, but, you know, a lot of kind of imaginary laws have been enacted, like in Seattle. I know there's talk about if you have an umbrella and you're not standing, it's considered a structure. You know, that has never been a law in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But with Occupy Seattle, with, you know, in the past trying to shut down that encamp encampment, they're kind of creating these new rules to fit the scenario. And I think, and I, it'll be interesting to see where that goes in the future. Yeah, actually, uh, on that point of, like, officers not quite, quite all being on the same page, there was a story that I read on Al Jazeera about uh, Occupy Wall Street and the, and the kind of the images that you're seeing come out of there. One of the, one of the observations that somebody made was that there are a lot of uh, white-shirted officers that, that are, like, doing a lot of the evictions that are, that are really getting into it with the protesters. And those are, those are actually, like, the commanders, like those are the guys that are supposed to be sitting back yeah. and telling, like, the... Uh, I'm not sure if it's black or dark blue, but it's the it's the dark-shirted shirt uh, police officers that are supposed to be the ones that are, like... that are that are supposed to be, like, making the actual encounters with, with protesters. And they're, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be the ones making arrests, uh, breaking up crowds. But for some reason, you, you don't see them doing it. It's their commanding officers that, that end up getting into a lot of that. In the... And the media coverage you hear a lot about from, so for example, if you ever watch Fox News about how this is actually good for the movement and they want this to happen, and they're exactly right. And, and I wouldn't say that a lot of times about Fox News per se, but in this instance, the UC Davis event actually drew more attention to what's going on. That's the point of a civil resistance. That's the point of these actions. It is to bring attention and to bring what I would call the evil that's being done, the corporate greed that's running our country up to the forefront and behind being 
you know, uncovered and in the closets. So as this action is being taken, then it's it's actually to the benefit of keeping the Occupy movement. And in Tacoma, some of the reason that we haven't seen that is the Occupy movement is on state land, not city land. So it actually has to be the state from the governor taking an action to remove those people. It's the perfect location on the State History Museum, Federal Courthouse land that's right by the um, the interstate's off-ramp, such that it's bringing attention. And that's part of Occupy Tacoma's premise, that they want to be protesting in unison with Aust- Occupy Wall Street, but they really don't want to be creating resistance of the police. You see a sign in the front that says, Occupy Tacoma supports the Tacoma Police Department. So I don't think that we're going to see, unless they decide to take an aggressive move of saying, we want to have some of that, or bringing those type of things out. If the University of Puget Sound students went out and blocked Union Avenue, I think that you would end up being pl- uh, pepper sprayed by the Tacoma Police Department. If you wanted to do something that was intentionally to break the law and say, we are really in agreement, we want to grab national headlines, you could absolutely absolutely do that. Or if you did a street that's a major traffic way for people coming home from work in the wealthiest neighborhood in our community, you would be pepper sprayed and probably removed. All right, we're at the end of our show now. Uh, Polly and Jamie, I want to thank both of you for coming into the studio today. It's been a great conversation. Great, thanks. Thank you. Great conversation, Casey. All right, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of Across Campus. We'll see you next week.